Hello and welcome to the first of two class apps on Japan's constitution. My name is Ethan Siegel. I'm a professor of Japanese history at Michigan State University, and I've worked with the University of Colorado's program for teaching East Asia for several years now. In this presentation, I'll explain why Japan's current constitution is so remarkable and provide some insight into its creation and passage, focusing primarily on the 1940s. In part two, which is a separate video, I'll address contemporary issues, including calls for constitutional revision. These apps are part of the TEA project, Japan's Olympic Opportunity, and are supported by the NCTA, the National Consortium for Teaching About Asia. Now, why devote two apps to Japan's constitution? Well, this document, sometimes called the post-war constitution or the peace constitution, is noteworthy for several reasons. First, it greatly expanded the rights of ordinary Japanese citizens, including women and workers. Second, it is unique as the only constitution that renounces the right of a nation to go to war. Third, the constitution and the US occupation of Japan as a whole is sometimes cited as proof that America can refashion other countries in its own image. That's exactly what Bush administration officials did in the months leading up to the invasion of Iraq, for example, though remaking Iraq proved much more difficult than they anticipated. And as this talk will explain, the occupation of Japan was not quite as one-sided as some seem to remember it. Finally, although many in the Japanese public seem to like the current constitution as is, politicians, including Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, have been calling for changes. Changes, however, could hurt Japan's relations with its neighbors, increase the possibility of war in the region, lower the status of Japanese women, and raise other issues, making constitutional reform a hot topic both in and outside of Japan. During this talk, I'll provide information to help answer four sets of questions. I'll begin with historical context. What were earlier governments in Japan like? And how did the 1947 constitution compare to Japan's only other constitution, the Meiji constitution of 1890? Next, I'll turn to the people who created the post-war constitution, including American and Japanese officials. I'll then briefly highlight some of the constitution's key provisions, and lastly, explain how a foreign-imposed constitution came to resonate so strongly with the Japanese public. So let's get started. Now, Japan has a long history going back some 1,500 years, but regardless of whether it was the centuries when the country was governed by aristocratic nobles or the time when the samurai helped run the country, in either case, there was no role for ordinary people to play in their own governance. There was no constitution, no elections or representative officials, and almost no legal recourse for those who felt oppressed. However, by the mid 19th century, authoritarian government began to be seen as a problem and pressure from the Western imperial powers, think Matthew Perry and his black ships, became a catalyst for change. In the late 1860s, a group of disaffected samurai led a revolution that we know as the Meiji Restoration. They sought to quickly modernize Japan so that it could stand as an equal to the advanced Western nations. They believed that participatory government, having a role for citizen subjects, was one key to the strength of the American and European powers. They needed people to willingly work in factories and send their young men into the army. In addition, many Japanese were exposed to the ideas of Western government through books and journals, and so began demanding roles for themselves. Some joined the so-called popular rights movement and pressed the Meiji government to hold elections and create a constitution. The government responded to such calls in the 1880s, sending one of its top officials, Ito Hirobumi, to study constitutions with European legal scholars. He was a primary author of Japan's first constitution, the Meiji Constitution of 1890. But he and others who authored that document wanted to give little real power to the people, just enough for them to buy into the government's agenda. So they modeled their new constitution on that of Prussia, which reserved many powers for the ruler and limited the ability of the people to influence government through elections. Here we see a picture celebrating the bestowal of the constitution, thought of as a gift from the emperor to the people. 
unlike the story of the American Revolution, in which people fought for their rights against an oppressive English monarch, this was the story of a benevolent Japanese emperor giving some limited rights and voice to his people. At least by American standards, the Meiji Constitution looks quite conservative. The emperor was the source of sovereignty and cabinet ministers answered to him rather than to the parliament. Only adult men who paid a certain minimum amount in taxes could vote and they could only elect representatives to the lower house. The upper house contained members appointed by the emperor and served as a check on the lower house. In short, this government gave the people and their elected officials a role, but it was a constrained role. Now, during the first half of the 20th century, this constitution enjoyed some success. Perhaps the best example is from the 1920s, a period known as Taisho democracy, when popularly elected politicians served as prime ministers and voting rights were extended to all adult males, regardless of how much they paid in taxes. But it was also under this constitution that right-wing militarists came to power in the 1930s, taking advantage of constitutional provisions that gave them a stranglehold on government cabinets. It was they who led the country down the disastrous path to war, first by invading China in the 1930s, then by launching the Pacific War in 1941, and ultimately resulting in Japan's defeat and unconditional surrender in 1945. This now is the setting for the creation of the post-war constitution. We're talking about 1945 to 1947, the early years of the U.S. occupation, when the country faced the greatest crisis of its existence. Two million Japanese were dead, another nine million had been left homeless, all of Japan's colonies and one quarter of the nation's wealth were gone, and there were major food and housing shortages. Political and military leaders and all that they stood for, all that the Japanese people had fought and sacrificed for, were discredited. And for the first time in its history, Japan was occupied by a foreign power. Technically, Japan was occupied by the Allies, but it was never divided among them the way that Germany was. In truth, the occupation was almost entirely American. Its leader was Douglas MacArthur, who had the title of SCAP, Supreme Commander of the Allied Powers. He made his headquarters at the Daiichi Seimei building, which you see in the photograph there, and Japanese referred to it and his staff as GHQ, or General Headquarters. Many members of that staff were influenced by Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal policies. They believed that American values and institutions were universal, and so they were eager to reform Japan along American lines. However, they held this optimism despite few among them knowing the Japanese language, which meant that they had to work with and through Japanese officials rather than do things on their own. Their goal was to, quote, democratize and demilitarize, end quote, so that Japan would never again go to war. As MacArthur famously stated, war's genesis lies in the despotic lust for power. Never has it originated in the voluntary actions of a free people. SCAP officials quickly got to work, disbanding the Japanese military, bringing millions of Japanese stranded overseas home, freeing political prisoners, and putting wartime leaders on trial. A notable exception, however, was the emperor, whom you see in this famous photo standing with MacArthur. Although many in Japan and among Japan's wartime allies felt that the emperor should be put on trial as a war criminal, or at least forced to abdicate, MacArthur believed that it was crucial to keep the emperor and use him to facilitate the American occupation, so he was spared any real punishment. However, Scap did have the emperor, who had been treated as a living god during the pre-war and wartime years, formally renounce his divine status on New Year's Day 1946 in the so-called Declaration of Humanity. In addition, although military leaders and right-wing politicians were purged from many positions of authority, some politicians, meaning elected officials, and many of the bureaucrats, meaning unelected administrators, were left in their offices. Remember, the occupiers knew little Japanese and so needed to enact its reforms with the help of Japanese officials. But while SCAP called the shots, that doesn't mean these Japanese officials lacked any influence at all. Some on the conservative side negotiated, dragged their feet, 
or subtly reinterpreted American directives to minimize changes. Others, who were more reform-minded, were eager partners because they had been pushing for some of the same changes that the Americans themselves were advocating. We can see this very clearly when we look at how the new Constitution came to be. American officials had long felt that the Meiji Constitution did a poor job of safeguarding democracy and rights. So MacArthur pushed the Japanese government to reform it. He later referred to this as, quote, probably the single most important accomplishment of the occupation, end quote. With Prime Minister Shidehara's assistance, GHQ turned to a legal scholar, Joji Matsumoto, to head a committee for constitutional revision. However, Matsumoto's group, citing the success of Taisho democracy, proposed few real changes other than making the military subordinate to the cabinet. Nor did they consider any of the suggestions made by a variety of Japanese groups outside of the government, everything from abolishing the imperial house to creating a union of Japanese republics. The lack of meaningful changes in Matsumoto's draft frustrated the Japanese public when it was leaked to a newspaper. It also frustrated MacArthur, who decided to take things into his own hands. In February of 1946, he assembled members of his staff, told them that they were now a constitutional convention, and gave them six days to come up with the draft constitution. The head of this effort was Colonel Charles Cades, who held a law degree from Harvard and had helped implement New Deal policies in the United States in the 1930s. Unlike Matsumoto, he and his fellow committee members did draw on the constitutions prepared by Japanese, such as the Constitutional Reform Society and the Socialist Party. And it was Cades who came up with the idea that the emperor should be a symbol of the state. Not quite what MacArthur originally intended, but MacArthur eventually signed off on it. Another member of the group was a young woman, Beate Shirota, who had grown up in Japan and was one of the only committee members to speak Japanese. Years later, she recalled grabbing a jeep and driver and going to the few libraries still standing in war-torn Tokyo to check out books on constitutions around the world. It was she who wrote the sections providing for equality for women. Here we see some of the key provisions of this initial American draft. Sovereignty lay with the people, not the emperor, and ministers had to answer to the Diet, which is the name for Japan's parliament. The peerage, meaning the hereditary nobles, was eliminated except for the imperial family, and universal adult suffrage finally gave women the vote. You'll notice that I did not include Article 9 in this list, the anti-war provision, because its origin is disputed. Some scholars think it may have been Charles Cady's idea, inspired by his admiration for the kellogg briand Pact of 1928. But Prime Minister Shidehara claimed in his memoirs to have proposed it to MacArthur himself. You'll also notice that this version calls for a unicameral legislature, but Japanese officials pushed successfully for a bicameral legislature in later negotiations. As these examples illustrate, not everything from the American draft was adopted in the final version. In fact, the process of creating and enacting the Constitution was quite complex and took several months. GHQ presented the English language draft to Matsumoto and to Foreign Minister Shigeru Yoshida, but the conservative officials balked at some of the radical changes included in this version. They feared that their power would be diminished if they answered to the people rather than to the emperor. And they claimed that bestowing too many rights would enable the communists to come to power. Matsumoto did not even share this draft with his cabinet until six days later. However, Scap told them that passing this constitution was the best hope they had to protect the emperor. If they delayed, then officials back in Washington, D.C. were likely to push for even more drastic changes. So the Japanese translated the document, but in doing so, watered down many of its provisions. And the result was a 30-hour marathon session of translation and negotiation between Scap and the government. The Japanese were unsuccessful in trying to keep the emperor as the highest authority and in trying to eliminate the preamble on people's sovereignty. But they won on a few issues, such as convincing the Americans that certain rights would be better addressed through extra constitutional legislation. They also won the use of the Japanese word kokumin for the people. 
This term, which could be literally translated as nationals or people of the nation, was significant because later Japanese legislators interpreted it to mean that foreign nationals living in Japan, such as resident Koreans and Taiwanese, were not protected by the rights guaranteed in the Constitution, since technically they were not hokumin. On March 6, 1946, the Prime Minister shared an outline of the proposed Constitution, in Japanese, of course, with the public. On that same day, both the Emperor and MacArthur indicated their support for this draft constitution. Shidehara, Prime Minister, praised the Emperor for calling for constitutional change, thereby linking the Emperor, the man for whom so many had died during the war, with the new peace constitution. Then there were several weeks of vigorous debate in the Diet. SCAP forbade any public acknowledgement that its staff had actually written the first draft, and it welcomed amendments as long as they didn't violate the basic principles of the proposed constitution. In fact, historian John Dower estimates that 80 to 90 percent of the changes put forward were allowed to stand. Now, most of these were minor, though some, such as a push by teachers to have the number of years of mandatory education raised from six to nine, impacted the entire population. It was also during these debates that subtle changes were made to Article 9, the peace provision, which would later prove to be very controversial, something we'll talk about in the next video, part two of this app. In the end, the Constitution passed easily with nearly unanimous votes in both houses of Parliament, even though its passage meant an end to the special status of the peers who served in the upper house. It came into effect several months later on May 3rd, 1947. Now, in truth, there were some in Japan and in the United States who did not really expect the, law, the new constitution to last, at least not after Japan regained its independence, which it did in 1952. Even though it was not publicly acknowledged that the Americans had ghost-written the original draft, in fact, officially, the new constitution was adopted as an amendment to the Meiji Constitution. Even so, many people could tell because some of the language in Japanese reads like it's a translation. And yet, the Japanese people embraced this new constitution wholeheartedly, and almost 70 years later, it has never been altered. Why? Well, one factor was an active campaign by a group called the Kempo Fukukai, or Committee for Popularizing the Constitution. From offices throughout the country, it held training sessions for government officials, published books and pamphlets for the general public and for school children, and created songs and playing cards to help promote the new constitution. But irrespective of these efforts, elements of the peace constitution clearly resonated with the Japanese people. They welcomed greater protections provided for women, workers, and others. Labor union membership rose dramatically, and women not only voted, but won some seats in the Japanese parliament. Keep in mind that some Japanese have been advocating for reforms like these since the 1920s, long before the U.S. occupation. So even though the Americans played a huge role in drafting the Constitution, the ideas in it were not foreign to the Japanese. The one exception might be Article 9, renouncing war, which was indeed unique. But the Japanese people, exhausted from 15 years of war, and eager to change other countries' view of Japan as a militarily aggressive nation, welcomed this too. Not all of the occupation era reforms endured. For example, the Americans' insistence on the breakup of big industrial conglomerates or better local autonomy for school districts, changes like these outside of the Constitution, some of them were altered after the Americans left. But the Constitution itself remains in its 1947 form. So what should we take away from this quick tour through Japanese constitutional history? Well, it certainly is true that during the occupation, the defeated Japanese seemingly had little ability to resist the occupying and victorious Americans. But it would be misleading to say that the Japanese passively accepted a constitution handed down to them from on high. As we saw with the outcry against the original Matsumoto draft, the Japanese public wanted real change. Non-governmental groups eagerly drafted their own constitutions that SCAP drew upon in preparing its initial version.
and the final product was one that was vigorously debated and amended in the Diet. The Japanese did contribute in some ways to the creation of their post-war constitution. Of course, that doesn't mean there hasn't been any controversy surrounding this constitution in the seven decades since 1947. There has been, and calls to amend it have been growing louder over the last 20 years or so. Please join me for part two of this class app in which we'll explore the contemporary issues and the ways in which they might affect Japanese society as well as international relations around the globe. Thank you.